So I try to keep the presentation very simple, but if you don't understand and there is something that is strange to you, please stop me and ask questions. Because maybe if I just passage one idea, for me is more than enough, but it's for you, so please interrupt me. All my presentation will deal with what you see in this picture. So this is a special contest, it's the mouse brain, and in particular we are in the cerebellum. So all the talk will deal with the cerebellum, and I will try to explain why we are so interested in this part of the brain. And during the talk I will present you two mouse models, one dealing with the cerebellum postnatal development, and the other one with benduloblastoma, that is a two or more brain that occurs in the cerebellum. And all the talk will be centered only on proliferation. So it's only one topic. Please try to follow. So we are in the Monterotondo campus, that is in the countryside north of Rome, and we are in an international environment, thanks to the vision of Blanco, that put together many international entities, ranging from the Mouse Mutant Archive to European Molecular Biology Outstation, and for a while, and I, and I, CGP. And for a while I was telling, and for a while we had also an ECGB outstation. So uh, the focus of the uh, course is on mouse genetics, but we took another approach that is the opposite. So we took an approach that is named reverse genetics. In this case, we start from a gene and we want to discover the phenotype. And you will hear a lot both of the genetic approach and both of the reverse genetic approach in the, during the course because many people will present data on both approaches and um, I will present data only on two mouse strains but you will hear a lot because the type of approach we use is the same approach that is used in a bigger scale in the mouse clinic. So this is the basis of what you will hear in the future. Normally, you, oh sorry, I was too fast. Normally, and this is our case, we start with the gene of interest, and then the first <coughs> thing you do is to understand where the protein of the gene is expressed. Then normally a good tool for the right genetic is to use knockout mice because you can produce phenotype related to the absence of the gene. And then you have to do normally a lot of phenotyping that range from anatomy to behavior. The less you know about <coughs> the gene, the more phenotyping you have to do. And this was our case. Because we start from a gene that we clone that was quite interesting because it was a G-protein couple receptor that are fundamental for life because they sense the environment and they could try to communicate with the cell where they are expressed and they act as a sensor for what is happening on the outside. And remember what I say because I will use exactly the same word later but for another thing, so try to remember. So we know that this receptor was expressed in the brain and especially in the cerebellum. And we generate a knockout mice using a technology that now is quite historical. It's the Crilox strategy, but it still has a lot of value, especially when you want to generate conditional mouse strain. And then, as you will see, we have to go through a lot of phenotyping because the situation was not as clear as we thought at the beginning. So the gene we are interested in is an orphan G-protein couple receptor. And although the gene was cloned nearly 20 years ago, today there is no a clear uh, ligand for these receptors. There are many claims, but there is a lot of controversy. And the only mutation that is known is a very rare mutation that is located in the internal loop and cause seizures. What we know and what we have done is the in-situ hybridization of this uh, gene, and as you are told <coughs> already, is specific of the brain, is never else in the body, and is specific of the cerebellum, that is this region here, 
any specific of these small cells that are not neuron cells, but are a special type of glia cells that they serve as support to the neurons that are located in close proximity to the neurons that in the cerebellum are the granule cells and the Purkinje cells, <coughs> as will be clear in the picture. So as I told you, there is a lot of controversy. Now there is a proposed ligand that is enough you remember that is a pro-survival factor for both neurons and glia cells. As I told you, we generate the knockout mice with this strategy and to create the knockout with the lead one exon. The, the structure of the gene is, was very simple, on, only two exons, so with the lead one. And then we went on the characterization <coughs> and we checked that everything was fine. Then normally when you have a mutant mouse, then you look for phenotype and sometimes it could be very easy because for instance, when you have a, a tumor like a medulloblastoma, just looking from the anatomy of the histology is very clear what is going on. But some other cases is not so simple. And this was the case of our knockout mice. So the mice were born, they were healthy, they were inherited with the Mendelian frequency, we <coughs> them, there was nothing strange. Haha, <laughs> and now what we do? And so we start a detailed uh, uh, analysis of the mutant. And the only phenotype we found was in behavior. So we perform this test that is quite common. You put the mice on a rotating row that could go at the certain speed or, or you can also challenge the mouse changing the speed so that the mice, they keep going with the increasing speed. And then you measure the time it takes to the mouse to fall down from the rotating road. And what was clear, we performed the test at three different times. We even challenged old mice. And what was clear from this test is that the knockout mice were always perfect, performing much better compared to the wild type. And astonishing, they were doing very well also when they age. But this was the only phenotype we had in our mice. So we, we have to reason what was going on. And as we were molecular biology, we have to go through <coughs> and start to study which, what is the importance of the area where the receptor was expressed. So as you will do, if you have something, a project like this, we went on and we start to study the cerebellum and how the cerebellum developed. What is important to know is that the cerebellum is important for movement, coordination, balance, and equilibrium. It's composed of two parts, the hemisphere and the central part that is named vermis. And if you cut at this level, what you find is a very organized structure that is organized in layers. And each layer in the adult cerebellum takes a name from the uh, type of cells that is expressed <coughs> there. So we have the internal part that is named granule cell layers because there are the, these small neurons are called granule cells. Then you have the upper layer that is the so-called Purkinje cell layers that is characterized by the cell body of the Purkinje cells. And then the, you have the so-called molecular layers where there are only few ty cell types and I, don't, I will not mention them because they're not important for, the, for this presentation. It's interesting to notice that in the cerebellum you have both the smallest cells of the brain and the biggest, uh, one of the biggest cells of the human brain. <coughs> And these two type of cells constitute about the 95% of all the neurons in the brain. So you, you have to think how important is motor coordination that the, the, there was a selection to put all this effort to create all these different cell types <laughs> in a single place in the, in the brain. Close to the 
close the, the Burkinji soma, there are these tiny cells that are the Bellmanglia cells. And those are the cells we are interested in. They are not very famous. In some test book, they are not even mentioned. <laughs> so we say, okay, we, we are lucky. And, but we keep going and not much is known about the function of those cells. In adulthood, they maintain the functioning of the Purkinje cells that is the masterpiece of the cerebellum because it is the cell that receives all the input and then is the only cell that communicates with the cortex. So it's the cell that decides how you have to move in a coordinated fashion. And then it has an important role during uh, postnatal cerebellum development because these cells <coughs> act as a, a base for granule cell uh, movement. And, I, and this I will show you in the next picture. So uh, cerebellum development occurs both embryonically and postnatally. And we are interested only in the postnatal part. What happened in the first 25 days of the mouse development is an enormous uh, amount of uh, proliferation that regard the granule cells, that they are uh, located in the stem granule layer that will disappear in adulthood. So in, at this level, they start to proliferate actively, then they start to migrate and they attach to the Bermanglia cells, where reaching the final destination that is in the internal granule layer. <coughs> in the meantime, the Purkinje cells that are already there and they are postmetotic cells, so they don't proliferate, they just differentiate and maturate. And the same type of uh, differentiation and maturation occur also at the level of the Bermanglia cells. But if you look in the literature, not much is known about it. So at the end, you have each cell type in the postnatal cerebellum follow is a program of differentiation. But what is important is that the timing. So all the process should occur in, tw in 25 days in a very hierarchical fashion because if you delete any of these cell types, all the other will be affected. So there is a crosstalk between every cell type. <coughs> so luckily we have a marker for any type of cells, so we can follow the granule cells when they are proliferating and when they are already differentiated. We can follow the Purkinje cells and also the Bermanglia cells that are the cells we are interested more. And it's interesting to notice that the same type of uh, postnatal development occurs also in humans, but this takes much longer, nearly two years. And it's easy when you think about babies, it requires almost two years to have a proper coordination. So, uh, as we, had, uh, we were dealing with postnatal development, we start to search for pathways that are involved in postnatal cerebellum development. There are many of them, but we found that the one that was involved in our case was the pathway of the sonic hedgehog. This pathway is very famous, is known for nearly 30 years. Of course, in oh sorry, of course, specifically in the brains, and is indicated in red in this picture, and has to do a lot with the uh, brain development and the patterning. So, <coughs> what happened in the postnatal cerebellum is that Sony Ajok is produced by Purkinje cells and acts as a proliferating uh, mycogen on granule cells. The pathway is quite complicated because it consists of two receptors that are named patch and smoothness. And in a way that I will present you later, the ligand of the sony to patch uh, remove an inhibition and on smoothness 
that will result in some proliferation. What is interesting to notice is that both types of receptor are not only expressed by the receiving cells that are the granule cells, but they are expressed both by Purkinje cells and on Bermanglia cells. And we were the first one to notice that because everybody when studied soniasium and cerebellum development, they were concerned about the cell producing sonic action, the pushing and the cell receiving, but they didn't put much attention on the Bermanglia cell. Now I have to introduce you a particular type of organelle that is almost unknown, that is named primary cilium. And this organelle is so important that when the, this organelle is not functioning, there are many diseases associated with it. It's named primary cilium, and the corresponding diseases are named ciliopathies. There are almost 50 ciliopathy, different ciliopathies associated with the primary cilium. And the primary cilium uh, was discovered really a century ago, but only recently is come back on the stage because people notice that almost every cell has the primary cilium. They are very difficult to study because they are a slight reprotrusion. They, are, they have one micrometer <coughs> diameter and they never reach more than five micrometer in length. So they are very difficult to catch. And uh, each cell has a primary uh, cilium, but it's different, it's difficult to follow them because any cell will express different marker for the primary cilium. So that's why it's so difficult to study them. Normally they function as chemical sensation, signal transduction, and control of cell growth. They have a special structure, highly organized, that consists in an axonym and a basal body that originate for the mother centriole, so it's <coughs> the nucleus. And this is the structure at the electron microscope. It's different from the motile cilia because it consists only of nine microtubule pair, while the mobile cilia, they have a, a, a doublet <coughs> also in the middle. Why is primary cilium is so important for the sonic hydro pathway? Because in the cerebellum, the sonic hydro activation doesn't occur all over on the cell membrane, but of course specifically on the primary cilium membrane. And what happened is that when in the off state, so sony hydrog is not present, you will have the first receptor patched located on the ciliary axonym, while the other re receptors mutated is kept inside the cells. So here we have a lot to do with the protein trafficking. When sonic hydrogen will arrive, this will cause patched to move out of the ciliary membrane, smoothening entering the membrane, and this <coughs> will result in activation of the target gene and will result in protein proliferation. So I, I make all this introduction because we discovered that this uh, the cilium are present in the cerebellum, not only at the level of the granule cells that was expected because they have to respond to sonic edge to proliferate during the 25 days of postnatal proliferation, but they are also present and they last also in adulthood at the level of the Purkinje cell layer. So no, they are not only present in the cells that are supposed to proliferate, but only on cells that are post-mitotic. So our question was, which is the role of this primary cilium? And is this primary cilium responding to Sony Hydro, especially in adulthood, and why? So we could show that they are present both <coughs> at the level of the Purkinje cells and of the Bermanglia cells. 
We also perform an EM analysis and we were lucky enough to find a cilium in serial section originating from the Bermanglia cells because the primary cilium for Kinsey cell was previously published. So just looking at the cilia number, we found there was an effect in the knockout mice of our receptor on the number of uh, cilia in the external granule layer where proliferation occurs. But strangely, we found also an alteration in the cilia number at the level of the good hinge cell layer. And just performing single experiments with BRDU incorporation, that is incorporating wild cells are proliferating, we could show that uh, both granule cells and Bermanglia cells are affected in the knockout and at the level of proliferation. <coughs> so I didn't have the time to show you, but uh, in addition to this effect on the proliferation of both granule cells and Bermanglia cells, we have an effect in our knockout dealing with all the other cell types because as I told you, all the things must occur in a coordinated fashion. So we found that also uh, Purkinje neurons were affected. We found the dysregulation of the sonic hydro pathway and importantly, we could show that our receptor that is expressed on Bermanglia cells form a, 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 um, an interaction with Patchett, that is the first receptor for sonic hydro. At this point, we had many questions to understand which is the role of the interaction of our receptor with the patch component of the sonic hydro pathway. And essentially, we wanted to know <coughs> where this interaction was occurring whether the primary cilius was involved, when it occurred, and why, which was the purpose of this uh, interaction. And we used two mouse model, the receptor knockout model, and a model we obtained by crossing our receptor knockout animal with the mouse model of medulloblastoma. Right. So the first thing we wanted to know was, as the uh, cilia are expressed on Bermanglia cells, was whether our receptor was expressed on cilia, because as you can imagine, cilium has to sense the environment, like receptors. So many receptors are expressed on the ciliary membrane. And we wanted to know whether also our receptor was expressed on cilia. And this is the staining we got. You see, we, we see sometimes colocalization at the cilium base, but the result was not clear. So uh, the, when you have a mouse, you can also move easily from uh, the mouse <coughs> to the cell culture. So as, as I show you, our receptor has to do with proliferation. <coughs> we wanted to test the effect of the deletion of the receptor in a well-known model of uh, uh, brain tumor that are the medulla blastoma. And there are good uh, mouse model for this type of tumor, that is the patched heterozygous mice. And just to remember, remind you, this is the situation of our knockout. We have decreased proliferation of the external granule cells. So we wanted to, to test what was the results of the uh, crossing between these two uh, mouse lines in terms of progression and incidence of medulloblastoma formation. It's important to keep in mind that uh, in this mouse model, the origin of medulloblastoma is supposed to be, is supposed to originate from the residual cells in the external granulate. So we follow two groups of mice. The first group, we just uh, observe the mice daily and 
They were euthanized when tumor was evident by touching, and we sacrificed them, and then we proceed with the analysis. While with the second group, mice were sacrificed at selected time points. They were covering the postnatal cerebellum development and adulthood. And then we analyzed the cerebella for uh, pretumoral lesions, formation of medulloblastoma to evaluate tumor progression that was apparent already by the histology. These are just the people that did the work in the lab of Glauco and Sima. She's an um, Iranian student that just finished her thesis work and she will discuss the thesis next week. And then I have to thank Julia from the European Molecular Biology Laboratory that helped us with the electron microscopy studies. And thank you. Thank you very much.